As you can probably tell, today's episode is about the hidden world of moss. If you take a mindful walk outside, you will notice that mosses are all around us. Mosses grow not only in forests, but also on the outer walls of houses and on the roofs, on the bark of trees, on stones and even in the cracks in the pavement. It really surrounds us everywhere, almost like a kind of cosmos, pun intended. I had the idea that we could investigate whether the mosses and its inhabitants differ depending on where it grows. And today we start with the street moss. I call it that because it's about the moss that is typically found in the cracks and joints of sidewalks and streets. So I went outside to collect some of that street moss and this is what it looks like. It seems pretty parched and dry since it hasn't rained in a while here where I live. I collected this moss together with the soil in which it is attached and put it in this jar. Once home, I soaked half of it in tap water to bring back to life any aquatic microorganisms that might be living in it. But first, let's take a look at the parched moss under the microscope. There are many different types of mosses and they differ depending on the environment in which they grow. Our collected street moss looks very dried out here. However, it is well adapted to the environment and this survives periods without rain quite easily. Unlike other plants, mosses do not have roots. They form root-like structures, called rhizoids. However, they do not serve to absorb water and nutrients. Instead, moisture is absorbed directly into the cells by osmosis. The main function of rhizoids is to attach the plant to its substrate. Here you can see a small piece of the moss after I soaked it in water. Those round shapes there are air bubbles trapped in the moss leaves under the cover glass. Under a higher magnification, we can see these greenish, thin-walled moss cells. They are green because of the pigment chlorophyll, which is stored in the chloroplasts. These moss cells here are filled to the brim with them. This allows the plant to perform photosynthesis and produce its own food from sunlight. Mosses are crucial for soil stabilization and water retention, helping to prevent flooding and landslides. They also serve as a food source and habitat for macro and microorganisms, like these little ciliates here. But a very cute and also chubby little critter is especially common in mosses. This is a tardigrade. Tardigrades are also called moss piglets or water bears. With its eight stubby legs and clumsy way of moving around, it really reminds me a lot of a chubby little bear. Tardigrades can be found everywhere whether in the sea, in fresh water, but mainly in moist habitats. Here our clumsy bear is roughly jostled by a very impetuous nematode. How rude! On their stubby legs or claws that help them cling to plant matter. Water bears do not have teeth. Instead, their tubular mouth opening is armed with spear-like structures. This allows them to pierce their food and then sucking it out. And they are not really picky. They eat algae, plant cells, but also other invertebrates, for example nematodes, like the root one from earlier. 
Most freshwater tardigrades are white or colorless. The color of some terrestrial species can vary. Some are pink or green, yellow, purple, black, or, as in our case, brown. The coloration is either caused by pigments in the outer skin, the cuticle, or is dependent on the digested food. But what these cute little chubby bears are really known for is their ability to survive the most extreme conditions. They are among the most resilient animals known. To survive, they fall into a death-like state called cryptobiosis, in which metabolic activities come to a reversible stop. As a result, they can remain for many years until the environment becomes more life-friendly again. And then I came across this strangely moving thing. This is a type of algae, more precisely, a microalgae, and it is called diatom. Diatoms are also found all over the world, and they have an almost infinite variety of shapes and sizes, like snowflakes. Have you ever seen those brownish slimy sediments at the bottom of puddles? Or that strange brown coating on the surface of aquatic plants? Well, that are clusters of diatoms. This diatom here can move around with the help of its raphe. A raphe is a slit-shaped opening from which they secrete a type of mucus that allows them to glide on a surface. Anyone who has seen my previous video on potting soil certainly knows what kind of microorganism we are dealing with here. Obviously, this is a rotifer. There were plenty of them in our street moss. Here we can observe a rotifer creating a kind of vertex using its rotating, wheel-like ring of cilia on its head and by doing so, it swirls tiny food particles towards itself. Also typical of rotifers is the clearly visible, rhythmically contracting gizzard. On its foot it has toes. They are equipped with adhesive glands that allow the rotifer to attach itself to a substrate. Here it has attached itself to a small piece of moss. And here is another nematode. I also found many of them in our moss sample, much to the delight of our chubby little bears, as nematodes are on their menu. Nematodes are usually small white to colorless, filamentous worms that live primarily in moist environments. Some are parasitic, and there are even human pathogenic types, such as roundworms. The heads of nematodes have small, eye-like sensory organs, as well as a muscular mouth opening. There are also bristles that serve the sense of touch. Their skin secretes a thick outer protective layer, which is also called cuticle. As a result, the nematode is more likely to be protected from desiccation and other harsh environmental conditions. The snake-like movements are created by their longitudinal body muscles and they are typical of most nematodes. So, did you like the microscopic adventure of the hidden world of street moss? Would you have guessed that there are so many interesting little critters living in the cracks of sidewalks and streets? I am curious to see if the inhabitants of moss will differ depending on where it grows. Which one should we explore next? Tree bark moss? Moss that covers dead wood or moss that grows on the forest floor? Let me know in the comments. And if you liked the first episode of our trip into the 
Cosmos, feel free to subscribe to my channel. There should be a subscribe button somewhere below the video. I'm also on Instagram. If you want to follow me there, the link is in the description. Thank you and see you next time!